have to start by apologizing to the audience. Unfortunately, generative AI has also made it to my SQL days. So. Uh, jokes aside, I'm here to talk a bit about upcoming features in uh, my SQL input that will bring uh, capabilities to support generative AI in the Vector Store. Um, I would like to run a bit of a survey first. I assume you all know about ChatGPT if you have anything under the rock. So you probably know what generic AI large language models is, are. But do you know what retrieval augmented generation is? Who knows about it? Okay, what of you today? <laughs> so I'm on a roll. So both Khan and I talk about MySQL e with Lakehouse and uh, how it allows us to process data from object storage as well as uh, InnoDB tables and offers, in addition to uh, accelerating analytic workload, also additional functionality as Automail and Pilot. And in the near future, we'll see uh, this extended to support, to add, automatically will add support for generative AI, and we also add support for vector store. So we will be able to handle uh, vector columns. Basically, this is needed so that user can query and retrieve information in natural language and uh, to allow efficient searching of documents in object storage using vector store. And as part of these additional features, we are also going to add support for uh, additional type of uh, files in object storage, not only semi-structured files like CSV, Parquet, Avro, or database exports, but also uh, unstructured files like PDFs and PowerPoints. So, whenever someone wants to do generative AI, they always are faced with challenges, but in my opinion, there are two major challenges. First of all, large language models by their nature are prone to the so-called hallucinations, which there is a very well-defined uh, definition of it, but I like to think of this way, a plausible but false or misleading response generated by an AI algorithm. If any one of you has played a bit with ChatGPT, they, they probably have noticed how after a while it seems like what, the, what is he talking about, especially when you ask about something you know. <laughs> and it will still be, so it will still look somewhat reliable if you didn't know what you asked about. Yeah. And I really like this quote. ChatGPT has been, uh, has been, uh, described by Professor Eta Mollick as an omniscient, eager to please intern who sometimes like you. The only thing I would change is that sometimes might be a bit reductive. <laughs> in fact, some studies estimate chatbots to lose <laughs> as much as 20% of the time. And another study, as I think that was done on top of uh, Stack Overflow uh, answering question, it actually found that 46% uh, of the answer had factually incorrect uh, uh, things inside the answer. Mm. So the question is, how can we mitigate these inherent issues in LLMs? And the second issue is, how do we incorporate additional information sources in LLMs? Because at the core by itself, the LLM can generate information only based on the knowledge from their training data. In fact, you probably heard these large language models that have billions of parameters. Now, the tiny version of it are seven billion parameters. Uh, I wouldn't call it tiny, but uh, relatively to uh, large language models, they are small. And basically what happens is they store all the knowledge from the training data within these uh, billions of parameters. But this has two inherent limitations. Given the size of the investment needed that, uh, to collect this data and to create this data, 
the training data <laughs> tends to be out of date or to go out of date relatively fast because you will not repeat all this uh, exercise every month or so. In fact, ChatGPT training data contains information only until January 2022, which means Typical example, you might have already seen in the news. If you ask ChatGPT who wants the World Cup, uh, the football World Cup, it couldn't answer it. Nowadays, it can, but through other means, not by the LLM by itself. The other inherent limitation is that Pre-trained LLMs are only trained on public available information, information from the internet. It is not, it's certainly not trained on your business data, but you might want to actually get answer from that. LLMs however have the capability to generate answer only from two sources of, uh, sources of data. The first, as we said, the information memorizer training time within the model, but there is also information in the query that you are providing. This means whenever you want to incorporate additional information in LLM, we have two strategies. The first is fine tuning. So fine tuning means we take the LLM, and uh, we continue training it. So we go for additional training rounds on the additional training data. It's usually a costly process. You need to set up a GPU cluster in most cases, and it also requires expertise. It will take time, etc., etc. <laughs> a more promising approach consists in uh, the so-called grounding. So grounding the LLM on actual facts. And that means instead of Trying to provide information there in the model itself will, lead, will let the LLM work on the information memorized in the training data, but we add any additional relevant information as part of the query. So we append that additional information uh, within the query. We usually prepend the information and then we come with the actual question. This is possible since LLM nowadays have very large context windows, which is the maximum number of tokens that can take into account a simple context evaluation. And that's where uh, retrieval augmented generation comes into play. Basically, this is an LLM framework which wants to leverage the grounding process to solve both challenges that we've seen before. First of all, we want to be able to generate higher quality responses and mitigate our hallucination. And grounding has been shown that it is effective in uh, reducing hallucination because the LLM takes into account, uh, takes into account the facts that you are providing as part of the query, and that helps it to basically stay on topic and uh, provide more accurate answer. But still, uh, I'm not saying it completely eliminates it, far from it, but it is effective at least making sure that it remains on, the, uh, on topic. And uh, it can also be combined with prompt engineering to further enhance its effects. And the second uh, goal of uh, retail augmented generation is to automate and make the Gaudi process efficient. And the question then becomes how do we efficiently look for uh, relevant information from external sources and incorporate it in the context window. And that is really an information retrieval problem. So in fact, grounding is all about, uh, grounding, sorry, retrieval method generation is all about information retrieval. So, let's think a moment how we would do LLM grounding manually. So what we have is a user asking a question, and before passing that question to LLM, we actually, based on the question, we go looking for any relevant documents from different sources. I might go to the internet, I might go to my library, <coughs> copy some relevant text, and then I pass off the knowledge that uh, I deem relevant to my question to the LLM together with the question, and uh, I'll get my answer, which should be uh, should uh, be more useful. There are basically 
What it does is it automates all this part by adding an information retrieval component. And RAG, in order to work, it needs three essential components. The first is the LLM itself, which isn't only used to generate the answer, but it's also used to encode the question into a vector. That's actually a quite important aspect of large language models. They belong to a class of models called transformers, and all these transformers work internally by generating vector representation of uh, text. Any text you pass to uh, a transformer model, the final outlook that you get will be text, but internally there is an intermediate vector representation that represents that text in a, into a vector space. And that's a meaningful representation of the text that's used internally by LLMs. And uh, you can expose that uh, information by just taking the encoder part of the LLM. So the first ingredient is we need the LLM itself. The second ingredient is we need a vector store where we can store, the, we can store all the vectors that we uh, that we obtain by applying the LLM encoder to our documents. And then we need a way of uh, performing similarity search. By doing this, we, there, we are then able to auto automate this entire path because the question asked will, be, will get embedded at runtime into uh, a vector. The vector store is already pre-populated with uh, uh, with all vector embeddings from uh, any specific knowledge base we care about. So after running the similarity search, we'll uh, get a list of relevant documents that can be used to generate the plots. So why do we think it's a good idea to do it in uh, MySQL e with Lakehouse? If you think about it, both all up and uh, RAD, they might be an oversimplification, of course, but they both pay to answer user queries based on relevant information from a knowledge base. They just differ in uh, how they organize the knowledge base. In one case, it's in the database table, in the other, it's in a vector store. And uh, how the user asks the query. And uh, the equal cluster is right at the section of two important knowledge base types, the database tables from InnoDB and the abstraction documents in object storage, in particular, where prioritized PDFs. So from that perspective, it certainly makes sense to uh, implement retrieval augmented generation for uh, in the equal cluster. As I said, we need three ingredients to do retrieval of meta generation. The first ingredient is we need to be able to serve an LLM model. Uh, luckily, I can talk about it because it's already in the GA. Um, MySQL Heatwave can leverage internally the OCI generative AI service that has been launched. And that has support for two classes of models, the coherent LLM models, that allows, uh, that allows uh, different types of uh, tech generation, depending whether you prefer summarization or, to, or another type of text generation. And it also offers support for uh, uh, the Lava 2 open source model. So from that perspective, initially MySQL Heatwave will leverage this uh, integration with the OCI The second ingredient is the vector store. And as I was explaining before, the vector store is important to manage vector embeddings that will come from different knowledge bases. In fact, it does make sense to think of uh, not having a single, uh, the, as in a database, it do, doesn't make sense to put all the different knowledge base of, uh, of a business 
into the same bucket, but rather organizing it into different vector storms so that based on uh, the query you need to answer, can embed only specific uh, knowledge base. As I was saying before, the vector embeddings are generated by the encoder component of the LLM, and vector embeddings are important because they capture the semantics of the underlying text. Semantics is a um, known concept into, in uh, natural language processing, and it's basically about the, when we say that this vector cap uh, captures semantics, what we really mean is that the distance between uh, elements in the vector space reflects the semantic distance between what this words represent, what this words meaning represents. The typical example we have is that the distance between king and queen is the same as the distance between man and woman. That's quite clear in uh, natural language, but that is also when the vector represent, uh, is a good semantic representation, this is also reflected in the corresponding vector representation. So the vector of king minus the vector of man plus the vector of woman is roughly equal to the vector of queen. And that's actually what, uh, what makes all these vector embeddings uh, so powerful for the text and energy. Now the question that we want to solve with MySQL with is how we can easily efficiently populate vector storm with all such embeddings. And uh, the Lakehouse team is actually working on uh, uh, making uh, the ingestion of documents in various format uh, easy and efficient uh, directly from object storage. So the customer should be able to simply add them uh, if the relevant documents in object storage and then start an input so they come to already create the microphone. The last ingredient is similarity search. And similarity search because, uh, as we said, the backlog captures semantics. So the most relevant documents for a user query simply because the closest vector embeddings in the vector space. There are different ways we can compute similarity of vectors. So we have the cosine distance, we have the hidden distance. So difficult to separate what is the best, uh, the best distance to start with. So uh, better to think of having options. And it's also important to remember that computing similarities, when we need to look for the most relevant documents, we need to compute similarities between uh, the current query and uh, all the vectors in the vector store, which can easily become costly. So various types of indices are commonly used to speed up uh, similarity search at the cost of approximation. And this is also what we're looking for. Okay, with that, I would like to wrap up my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes? Um, you have like a phase, like in Oracle space, that people are using like the vector database in the equation at the moment? Oh, at the moment, uh, the vector database is in the private preview. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's not available. It's not uh, available yet. All right. No, no, it's not yet. Uh, otherwise, I could talk more about it.